Well, uh, have you ever, guys ever had that, uh, uh, tonight's message is called The False Victory. Have you ever had where it, it, it looked like you were finally out of a bad situation and you thought, okay, now we're finally going to plow ahead, we got blue skies ahead, and then out of nowhere, you're right back in the situation you thought you were free from. It's kind of troubling when that happens. You're like, darn it, I woke up and the sky was blue. Where did all these clouds come from? Come on, God. And that's exactly what we're going to look at tonight. You know, there's a lot of people who don't believe that the exodus of the Bible actually happened, that event of Israel coming out of Egypt. And uh, I find it extremely um, I, unbelievable is what I would say. I guess that's the word. I find it unbelievable to not believe in the exodus. And... Um, there's just so many things, and we're going to look at some of these. Um, but let's, I guess let's start at the beginning, and then when I get to the end, I'll stop. So, in Genesis, in Genesis, uh, it kind of, the book kind of ends uh, with those people who would eventually become Israel ending up here uh, in Egypt. Okay? Now, this is the land of Goshen, they figure, up north. Okay? So they came down from way up on over here yonder. Well, actually, technically over here, then they went up, and then they came down, and then they kind of hung out over here, and then some of them went over here, and then they come back. Well, anyways, they all ended up here anyways, by the end of Genesis. So after all that, you know, here's the bottom line. They ended up there. Uh, and this was about the 1900s or so uh, BC. And over time, uh, Israel became spread out uh, throughout the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, it says, um, It says, But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. So as time went on, they weren't here anymore. They were here. See? And one of the big things that people say is, well, there's no proof of the Israelites ever being in Egypt. Well, actually, there is. Um, we found multiple uh, records with uh, the Israelites' names on them. Um, they believe that they found Joseph's tomb. I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, there's just an abundance of, of graves that we found from Semitic peoples. There's um, even Egyptian records talking about them, but I guess we'll just put that on hold. Uh, so as time went on, they became slaves. But a common misconception is that they built the pyramids. I know that old movie really made that idea very popular. The truth is that, the, is that the pyramids existed long before Israel was over there. So they did, they did not build the pyramids. Um, another, another big misconception is that they built a city using the brick that they had made. That, it never once says that. It just says that they built brick. It never says what happened to the brick. So there's a few misunderstandings that people just kind of read into the Bible and then they say, ah, that proves it's not true, and it, it doesn't say that that's what happened. Um, they, they built brick. They, they, they worked a lot in the fields, taking care of animals. Uh, they helped with uh, the produce of the Egyptians. Uh, <coughs> that kind of stuff. Now, uh, archaeology shows that there were Semitic peoples there. Um, in, in the north. You uh, see, the, 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 one of the problems is, is that the Bible says that they, that they built um, the city of Ramses. And the problem is, is that city didn't exist until the Israelites were gone. And uh, why this is, is because in the Bible, they oftentimes would update names with what it would later be called. See, that city that you know as Ramses, well, before it was known as Ramses, it was known as this other thing. But you're not going to remember that, so I'm just going to call it Ramses, because that's what you know it as. Does that kind of make sense? And it also never says that they built the city itself. It says that they built storehouses that were at the same location that the city would one day be in. So once again, if you actually pay attention to the wording that it says, um, you know, Israel was not that big of a nation. They didn't do these big feats in Egypt. They did small things. And once again, they were spread out throughout the land of Egypt. Now, after Joseph, um, there were these people called the Huxos that uh, gradually came in and took over northern uh, Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, northern, northern Egypt. And the Pharaoh in Exodus is afraid that the Israelites are going to unify with these people because the Egypt, and the, I'm sorry, the Pharaoh had to move on down south while the Huxos were up north. And there were some Israelites up here and there were also some down here because it says that 
Moses was put in a basket and Pharaoh's daughter found him. So that would mean that Moses lived way down in Southern because that's where the capital was. Um, and so then this Pharaoh who lives in the South says, Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us. Who are the people who hated them? The Huxos. Now, obviously, we know how this event ends. The Huxos and them go to war, and then eventually, in about 1550 BC, they're kicked out, and Egypt moves back in, they're back in control of the whole land. However, just because they regained control of the land, the pharaohs didn't let up on their persecution of Israel. In fact, they just continued chugging along. Hey, free slave labor. We also have abundant proof that the Egyptians did have slaves at this time that they also took from Canaan. So I know a lot of people say there's no evidence of, of Egypt having slaves. That's not true. There's an abundance of uh, proof of Egypt having slaves at this time. Um, so let's see, what else? Still, those left in Goshen up here were nomads. For those of you who don't know what that means, that means they didn't build houses. They traveled around. So there's not gonna be a whole big abundance of proof of nomads living in a place. I mean, if you think real hard, well, what about the, uh, the, the Israelites that didn't live there? Well, actually, as I've said, they were throughout the land of Egypt, so they adopted Egyptian culture and they lived in Egyptian houses. Once again, they served as slaves. They were in the households, okay? Now, I know this gets a little bit confusing because later on he says, when he's giving the plagues, he says, it'll happen in everywhere except for the land of the Israelites, basically up here where the nomad Israelites were still living, the plagues didn't hit. That's what he's saying. Okay, so don't get, once again, you really have to understand the culture of what's going on before you just start yanking stuff out of context. Um, so after a series of plagues, they were released by Pharaoh Tuthmosis II. This guy, you can see how the scars and boils were still left on him. This helps us to date the Exodus to about 1479. Once again, an abundance of proof. Now we know that this was not a singular event because the pharaohs who came after him had signs of these marks as well, but they had time to heal, which means this guy died while the runes were still fresh. Kind of like e most Egypt ex Exodus says, right? So then there's also an abundance more proof. First off, uh, his wife took up the reins after he died chasing Israel into the Red Sea. And what she said, is that when she became the ruler, the Egypt was laid waste and destroyed by these vagabonds, these nomads that lived up in the north. Well, gee, I wonder who those were. Now, we know that they weren't the Huxos, as some people have said, because the Huxos were already out of Egypt, as I've already mentioned, for about 100 years before. So who were these vagabonds? Well, they were the Israelites. Just because they didn't call them Israelites doesn't mean that they weren't the Israelites. Plus, the only other people that we have record of being there and doing something along these lines is Israel. So uh, besides that, um, uh, Egypt's uh, religion was completely altered. Uh, their main chief god at the time of the Exodus was a guy named Ra. Um, and eventually, uh, they actually switched over to uh, another guy named Aten after the Exodus. And the reason for the shifting of loyalty, if, if you take the event of the Exodus out of the picture, is unexplainable. In fact, it got so bad that there was one pharaoh who changed his name to Akhenaten, naming himself after that god. Why would he switch to monotheism when Egypt was a polytheistic culture? Except for this event. See, the, the event of the Exodus was so singular that it completely changed um, Egypt for a number of years. In fact, Egypt didn't go out to war after the Exodus for 22 years. For 22 years, they didn't get involved in any foreign conflict. Why is that? Their army was in the bottom of the Red Sea. <laughs> now we know that uh, Pharaoh kept his army here at Memphis, even though he was down here, okay? So if you look where the Red Sea is, when it says that he gathered up his army, it really didn't take him all that much. He came up from his capital, went to Memphis, and whoop, cut, cut over. Now you might say, well, that would take a couple days. Yes, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, anyways, uh, uh, Tuthmosis II's uh, wife, actually, uh, you know, normally they like to hype up the previous pharaoh because it's supposed to be a continuation of godhood. Um, we don't see that with her. She kind of glosses over him, and uh, there's just an abundance of, of, of proof of the exodus happening. Um, let's 
So one of the things uh, that people don't understand is it says in Exodus 14, 5 through 12, and we're getting to our main point. We're getting to our main point. But I just want to give some backstory. And, and you know, I, I love history, and I like other people to, um, to hear it because it really does set the tone for the whole passage. If you don't know of what's going on in, in, in Egypt or in Israel at this time, you're going to still be able to read the story. But you're not going to get the subtle, subtle nuances, okay? For instance, what was the first plague of Egypt? Anybody? Sea turned red. Okay, yes. There was actually an Egyptian story that predated the event of the Exodus by many hundreds of years where there's a scribe and he's complaining about the godlessness of the land. And he says that the, that the Nile was turned to blood. God using this miracle was something that showed them by their own records you are immoral, and you need to turn to me. See, God used things that meant something to the Egyptians. But see, it doesn't just stop there. The Nile to the Egyptians was a source of life. It was something sacred to them, and God took it from them. That's something big. See, I mean, God used these different things that meant something to the Egyptians. Every day, the God would go through the sky and give them light, and then every night he would go into the underworld and fight, and he would start the same process over and over again. Egyptians believed in a form of reincarnation. Everything just kind of was cyclical. It repeated itself. So what did God do? He took away the sun. See what I mean? God did things that meant something to them. But we don't understand that because we are Egyptians, and we're living thousands of years after the fact. So I'm trying to give a little bit of setting to why this is such a big deal. In Exodus chapter 14, uh, verses 5 through 12, it says this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people. And he said, what is this that we have done, what we, um, that we have let Israel go from serving us? Now, you might think, wow, in a day, they changed their mind. Well, it wasn't a day, actually. You see, that's, that's part of the thing. It probably took at least a week for them to get all the Israelites to come back up, meet them at Ramses where the grave of Joseph was so they could gather up the bones of Joseph and then take it into the promised land. Because if you remember, Joseph made them prom promise, when you go, take my bones with you. So they had to go get the bones. Well, that was e real easy for these guys that were already nomads up here. I mean, these are, whoop. well, what about these guys that were way down here in, in Pharaoh's court? Well, obviously it's gonna take them a little bit of marching. So we're talking about a span of at least a week that it took them to get back up to Ramses. Well, in that amount of time, they had time to clear their heads, bury their dead, mourn the loss, and now they're looking at the picture now that it's all over, and they're saying, hey, hold on a second. Maybe we messed up. See, we let them go. Let's go reconquer them. I mean, there was no rule against reconquering them. Okay, we've done their little evil deed for the day. We've let them go. Okay, all right. Well, now let's get them back. <coughs> So Israel met up in, in uh, Goshen to get Joseph's body. Um, if you look right, oh, sorry, it's uh, it's kind of acting up here. It's not doing things that I want it to be doing. Can you move ahead for me there, buddy? I don't know why it's not doing it. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I must have pushed something. The, you know, these things, they, uh, they have a mind of their own. Uh, this is a recreation of the um, tomb that they found of Joseph. Uh, it had a statue of a man in a multicolored coat, and it had 12 graves at the site. It, I mean, obviously it could be someone else, but it seems very strongly that it is Joseph, especially because where do you think it is? Right where, where Exodus says that they've built. So what are the chances that it's not Joseph's tomb? Well, I guess it, it, it's not definite. I mean, it doesn't say Joseph on it. But uh, the way that the tomb is made, it, it was someone of importance, and it was not a native Egyptian. That's what we know. And it was at the site that Exodus says they built the city at. That's what we know. So obviously it could be something else, but still, there's that. Um, so they meet up there to get the body. Um, probably took about one or two weeks. And then we get to Ex Exodus 4, 5, 14, 5 through 12. I'll keep reading. So he made the chariots ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over, um, over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. So I, I want you to kind of take yourself and put yourself here, okay? You've been serving a slaver. Okay, this is bad. Well, okay, you've been freed after all, things have gotten hard. You've seen, you've seen all these miraculous events. But hey, you're in the clear now. 
It's been a week or so, and you haven't heard jack squat. We're good. We made it into the clear, okay? Our time of constant sorrows are over. Well, now things are starting to look bad again. Verse 9, Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camp uh, camping by the sea beside Pi-Hahirath in front of Belzephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. By the, uh, so the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the, word, not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Well, you ungrateful little turds. I remember somebody at the beginning of this book whining, and it wasn't me. I was happy out there in the wilderness doing my own thing, okay? So let me just calm you right there and just remind you how the... Horse eats the cabbage or whatever eats whatever. Uh, so okay, we got these. these we got this little bit of a uh, hang up here. Um, so after going through all the nonsense, all the nonsense, getting victory, they they won, they did it. They are once again in the thick of nonsense. This just isn't fair, God. Things are going from bad to worse, and you're the instigator. If you had just left me alone, I would have been better off than I am now. I got victory, so that means I'm not supposed to have any more struggles. I'm sorry that is so small. Ah, that is a really small friend. Uh, I hope that you guys learn to see really small really quick, because uh, I can't change it from here. So I'll just read it to you, okay? That little note there says, uh, I got victory, so no more struggles. Have you ever felt like that? God, this is the end of the line, okay? I, we did this. We've been over this before, God. We, we nailed it the first time. Why repeat a challenge that I nailed the first time? We got it, God. We're out. We're clear. Just let me do my thing now. I just want to live happy now. These problems are just dragging on, and I thought I saw the victory. And here's really what I want you to, want you to get before I move to the next little section in verse 13. Do not forget the promises because of struggles. Do not forget the promises of God because, excuse me, because of the struggles that come. See, if they would have stopped for five seconds and remembered, oh yeah, God, the same God who did all those miraculous, excuse me, sorry, oh, the same God right, who we saw do all those miraculous things in Egypt, that same guy, okay, he's the same one that said that he'd bring us out. So I don't know what the crap is happening here, okay, this seems like a bad situation, it seems like it's only getting worse, but I know that you've got a plan somewhere to do something, I just don't know what that plan is. See, but that's not what they said, is it? Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us out here to die? Why have you done this to us? Why have you set your heart to just destroy us? Did we, did we irritate you something? Was it because we didn't invite your, your, your mom and, and, your, and your dad to the Christmas party? I told you I didn't like her potato salad. So then in verse 12, is this not the word that we spoke to in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. And you thought you had a bad church. <laughs> um, so now we read on to Exodus 14, same chapter, but go to the next verse, verse 13. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish, accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Wow, that's pretty final. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. I think he was telling them to shut up. <laughs> Did I read too much into that or is that exactly what he just said? Uh, the Lord will do this while you remain silent. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Now imagine the irony of all of this, okay? Just put yourself here. You're all happy, you're on cloud nine because you're out of slavery, everything's going great, you look back, Holy smokes, there's a big cloud of smoke coming at us. That must be Pharaoh. Holy smokes. Okay, so now things are really bad. Moses, this is all your fault. You shouldn't have done these things. You're, you're, you're terrible. It's all your fault. So then Moses is trying to do a little bit of damage control. Hey, you guys need to just be quiet for a little bit. And so then here comes God. What are you doing? Why are you sitting around asking me what to do? Go, go. Look, finish up the rest of the, rest of the verse. Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. 
why are you crying out to me? Go forward. But, uh, did, was I unclear the first time I spoke, or was it something? Was it something I said? But here's the thing in all this. Giving up ensures you won't see victory. If you give up, it is a promise you won't see victory. But it's hard, I know. But if you give up, you won't see victory, promise. But there's a chance I won't see victory anyways. Well, if you give up, you certainly won't. See, in our walk with God, it is all or nothing. There was no going back to Egypt. That's what, that's what the Israelites didn't understand. If they did go back to Israel, it wouldn't just be that they went back into slavery. Pharaoh would destroy them. He would take out his anger on them to prove how strong he was. Because they just shamed him in front of the entire nation. And Egypt had just started regaining power a couple hundred years before of, of, of the land around the Nile again. He couldn't lose that again. They worked too hard. See... And at that time, Egypt also had some holdings in Canaan, too. So to show, to show that they weren't all that powerful would mess up everything they had up here in control. And everything they had down here. You know, they, they frequently went to war with the little people called here the, down here called the Nubians. They were kind of a pain in the butt, constantly doing things. And then the Hooksos hadn't been gone that long. Which kind of leads me to my next uh, point here. Do not lose heart because of failed expectations. God, you weren't supposed to do it like that. This was supposed to be one and done. Well, we both know it wasn't one and done, was it? After Egypt was the easy part. All they had to do was sit there and watch the, watch the miracles happen. Well, then they had to go into the, and out into the desert and follow the law. And then they had to go, hypothetically, go into Canaan and fight the Canaanites. Well, we know that they didn't make it that far. <laughs> but it's hypothetically, they were supposed to have made it that far. So you don't lose heart because of failed expectations. Because here's the thing, and I want you to really remember this. God will most often and repeatedly use failed expectations to work a great miracle. Here's Israel just camped out in Egypt. They're having a good old time. The Pharaoh thinks that the Israelites are the greatest thing in the world. Well, then another Pharaoh comes, and he doesn't know what happened with the whole Joseph situation. He doesn't much care either. All that he sees is these hooks are coming in, and they're kind of going to be a problem. And so he sees these people, who are also foreigners. Didn't take long to do the math on that one. Just because we are caught off guard doesn't mean... God won't save. Just because we are caught off guard doesn't mean that God won't save. Because you have to remember something. Does God know everything? Yes. So did God know that this was going to happen? So the conclusion would be that God was not surprised, correct? So that would mean that their moment of panic and chaos was totally in God's control. But how could this be in your control, God? This is not according to the plan. We had a plan. We had an agreement. You said something about milk and honey. I'm kind of hungry. It sounds good. And now we're being chased by Pharaoh again. What happened in between A and B? I think I missed a step. You know, it's like the Pop-Tarts. You know, the, the instructions. You open them. You put them in the toaster. Was there another step between those two steps? I mean, did I miss something here, God? And that's what it kind of looks like. So just a few more things in closing. I hope that you kind of see what the picture is here going on. Yeah, it's hard, but God's got you. Amen. And hear me on this. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of the struggle or if you're past the struggle. It doesn't matter at all. Because it's not about the struggle. It's about the God of the struggle. Okay, There's a total difference there. And, 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 and the big point is where we put our focus. Okay, Where we put our focus. So it is hard, but God does definitely got you. When the struggle drags on, move forward. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. See, sometimes that's exactly what we do, isn't it? God, I'm going through this struggle. I'm so tired of it. Why are you sitting around whining? Get up. Go forward. What are you doing? See, we allow the pain and the hurt to blind us from the promise that God made us and blind us from the moving forward that God told us to do. Why were they camped out? Why were they just sitting there by the water crying? What 
how was that part of God's promise? And the truth the answer was it was not part of God's promise. So move forward even when it hurts. Move forward even when the struggle keeps dragging on. Move forward, move forward, move forward. And the last point, the little nugget of truth that I want you to get from this story is that even what the enemy means for evil, God works for our good and for his glory. This was ultimately for Israel's benefit. See, I don't think they were really remembering how things actually were in Egypt because they weren't good. See, this was difficult now at the time. But through that struggle, God was making something better for them, for their kids. See, he was giving them an inheritance. He was giving them a hope of a future. And get this, they didn't have the hope of a future in, in Egypt. There was no future for them there. But there was in Canaan. Do you get what is happening in the story? So don't be alarmed by the false victory, guys. Remember that. Move forward. Don't forget to move forward. And we're, we're, we're going to end it off there. Don't forget to move forward.